Hello and welcome to the 42nd episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to discuss what Alan's been playing with recently. We've also got another time-saving tip and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening or watching live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark and joining me this week are Alan. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Not quite sure why that was so funny. Tony. Good evening. And Laura. Hiya. What have you been up to then, Laura? Poison Tony. And then I went to... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thing Monk. Um, you, you did what? Uh, poison Tony. Oh, dear. Food poison. Yeah. That's why he's Ill. still ill. From still last ill. Still ill from last week. And then what? And then I went to Thing Monk. I left him in his sick bed. I, now, I saw a lot about Thing Monk on Twitter. Yeah. What is it? It's uh, It was a conference... Um, about Internet of Things. Ah. Was... And I bought a copy of Designing the Internet of Things uh, by Adrian McEwen, who's an og camper. Oh, cool. Oh, and right. I got it signed by him. Oh, oh awesome. <laughs> oh, did he <laughs> appear on you? eBay shortly? Yes, he knows me. What's the Internet of Things in a tweet? Uh, it's instead of people being between the devices and the internet... It's where the devices talk directly or connected directly to the internet and there's no people in between. So are they sending messages to one another or are they just broadcasting messages out? Potentially, backwards and forwards. Uh -huh. But also, say, like your home automation stuff, that's Internet of Things because okay. you've got sensors sending information to the internet right. and you could automate things going back again, mm -hmm. but people have still got to live in that environment mm -hmm. and how they understand that environment is really important because they'll try and understand it and then it could confuse them or they might assume something's happening that isn't happening and huh. yeah hmm. so and where, how long was this and was it like conference as in lectures and talks and stuff it was one day the it's a single track thing so you just sit and watch everything all the way through cracking food <laughs> Um, <laughs> Nothing about the talks, just oh yeah, the talks were good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but Dan Lynch gets a thank you in it as well. There's lots of Sue Black in and, the book, you mean? And, yeah, in the book, sorry, not in the conference. And Andy Piper and yeah. Oh, awesome, cool, cool. Alan, what have you been doing? I had my laptop fixed Ooh. today. What do you do to it? An IBM engineer. Well, it's been overheating for ages. Right. It's been like running at 90 degrees. I've got this little sensor Ooh, app on it. Ow. And it tells me it runs at, nine, well, more than that, 1995, especially when I want to hang out, which right. is a lot at work. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was kind of annoying me. And uh, eventually it overheated so much that it shut itself down. Which isn't good. No. So I phoned Lenovo and they sent an engineer and he came out today and replaced the fan and the heat sink. And now it runs at a balmy... 70 degrees right. <laughs> when mm. I'm doing a hangout, but under normal circumstances, it's fine. It keeps it at 70 degrees. It doesn't like overheat anymore. It's brilliant. Cool. So I'm, you'd recommend super happy. Lenovo's after sales care? Yeah, I would actually. Given like, all I did was phone the guy up and, or phone Lenovo, I didn't randomly phone this guy <laughs> up, <laughs> phone Lenovo support, and he said, What's wrong? And I said, It's overheating, going to 90 degrees and shutting down. He went, Okay, I'll see if we've got the part. I was like, Oh. I thought I'd have to provide diagnostics or hmm. more data for this uh, support call. But no, he just said, uh, yeah, we'll send someone out on Wednesday. And the guy came out and he had a fan and heat sink assembly, stripped the entire laptop down to nothing, like everything out of the case, mm -hmm. put the new one in and boot it up. And it's been perfect ever since. And I am so happy. Cool. I thought it was a kernel bug, but it's not. It's brilliant. rubbish hardware. Mm. Tony, what have you been up to other than being poisoned? Oh, I've been so ill. It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> But I, yeah, I, today I did some very exciting photography stuff, Ooh. which I can't tell you about. Oh. Oh. It is exciting. It is, is it a exciting. wedding? No, not a wedding. Although no. obviously that's, you know, I do a lot of are those. The, are these private yeah. photographs which you're not allowed to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the kind which you, you develop in your garden shed rather than taking them to the chemist? It's the kind that he will probably <laughs> blog about eventually, so no. Okay then. Okay. You that's the wonder of digital, Mark, is you don't have to take those to the... <laughs> <laughs> Should you be into that market, which I'm, which I'm not, but no, these were these were for uh, uh, a uh, a project for another company, which is oh, very exciting. Cool, which, but I can't tell you better. Oh, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll <sighs> it's frustrating. I'll wait to hear about it on your blog then. How about yeah, you, Mark? Twenty sixteen. I've been playing Doom Three BFG edition. Is Big that good? Friendly Giant, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. It's good fun because I played the original when it came out about uh, eight years ago, um, and they released a Linux port of the original version. And they've open sourced this version, but they never made a Linux port of it. So some clever old stick 
um, on GitHub has taken the open source version and I guess learnt from the Linux, old Linux port and made a Linux port of the new version. Nice. So I just downloaded it, compiled it, and installed. You have to install the the data files, which right. needs Windows they're not version supply, of they're Steam. Not, they're not open source, are exactly. they? So, yeah, you need the data. So you need the Windows version of Steam, which you can do through Wine, but I happen to be using a dual-booting laptop. Actually, I think I've got a DVD with uh, Doom 3 on the original. Mm. Yeah, so you so can you can just could get, get, off of that. get the port from that. Oh, right. So yeah, so I got I, I installed it on on Windows partition on the laptop. Then I switched over, mounted the Windows partition, compiled this binary from GitHub, and then pointed at the data files with a sim link and ran it. And hey, presto! Awesome. Yeah. Super. Should we crack on? So, uh, as you know, I've been um, backing a few things on Kickstarter and Indiegogo over the last year or so. Mm-hmm. And a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I've, yeah, I think I've overdone it this year. <laughs> but um, something arrived this week, one of my, um, one of my new things, and it's a, it's a kind of 3D printer. Uh-huh. What kind of 3D printer a, is it? A kind of 3D printer that you hold in your hand. Mm. It's, um, it's called a 3 doodler. And for the benefit of the camera, for those watching, I'm holding it in my hand now. It's it's like a big fat pen. Um, it's approximately six inches long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, black, quite chunky. Um, yeah, it's got a couple of buttons on it. Yeah, and a switch, and it takes power through a power cable from a mains adapter. Um, but I backed this some time ago, and uh, yeah, it's just arrived. And uh, yeah, it's quite cool. Okay, why is it cool? It's cool because um, I quite like the idea of having a 3D printer, but I didn't like the idea of having a great big bulky thing or mm. spending £500 on one. Because often 3D printers are about the size of a suitcase and have cogs and things that were around. They look and like the brick easily. Pe- people I know, who like Hugo, who has one, spends most of his time unclogging the nozzles rather than printing things. Yeah, yeah. And, and tweaking and adjusting. And mm. I, mean, th- I mean, to be fair, there are some people who have 3D printers that will just work. Mm. And there are ones that you can buy that, that arrive ready to go and you take it out of the box and off you go. And it, but they're you know, 10 times the cost of this thing. Right. Um, and so, and the other thing about this is it's not a 3D printer in that a, a standard 3D printer has a bed and a nozzle that's motor controlled, computer controlled, and will move backwards and forwards, up and down, and um, will deploy the plastic in a very uniform fashion. This is like handwriting plastic. It's like having a glue mm. gun right. with, with plastic. So um, this is, this is a, a plastic extruding 3D printer rather than a resin setting ultraviolet light type one. Yes, yes. And so you, you stick a piece of uh, plastic in the a, a, a length of plastic in the a end. Bit like you would with a propelling pencil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or a glue gun. Or a glue or gun. A glue in fact, gun. Yeah, more, like a, glue gun. more like a glue gun. It is very think, much yeah. like a glue gun. It takes um, the, the two main types of plastic is PLA and ABS. I don't know what that means, but. Honestly, lock breaking, I think, is. Right. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Tony. <laughs> Keep staying, stay being ill. <laughs> um, and. Uh, when when you when you turn the thing on, it heats up to the requisite temperature in order to melt the plastic, and then once it's at the red, relevant temperature, you just press a button and it starts extruding the plastic, and you basically draw on a page with it, um, and um, that's it. <laughs> and it, it 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 comes out hot, but then cools so quickly that by the time you finish drawing your thing, you can peel it off the page, and it's you know set hard. So when we say it's like three D you you have to layer up the plastic like you would with a 3d printer or can you actually draw things upwards as it were (laughs) yeah both of those things so yeah you can you can lay down layers you can also do um do a a, a, a construction where you have lots of flat pieces that you connect together to make it three dimensions do you glue them with the plastic like a soldering iron yeah i did um so tony's got a pair of glasses that i made with my daughter uh over there um and they're um basically one piece is the the front piece where the um surround for where the glass would be and then there's two pieces for the arms and the arms are just like one pattern that you just draw twice Mm -hmm. and then we just stuck them together just by holding the the pieces together and then draw around it a little bit in order to kind of melt it and glue it together and it took us half an hour to make a pair of glasses um 
and they're a little bit fragile because I only went over the thing once. But, you know, Mark said you could draw in 3D. You know, if I went over it two or three times, it would make it thicker and it would make it a little bit more robust because it's just one line of um, of uh, of the plastic. It's yeah, it's it's a little bit fragile. Um, For those watching on the video stream, I am now slowly rotating the glasses in front of the camera. <laughs> yes, they are in fact three D and yeah. not just drawn with brilliant perspective. I think you really should put them on, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might take, take my headphones off for a minute. Okay. I think you should take a still of it, and then we can put it on the show notes. That's probably a good idea. So um, when you made these glasses, did you design them yourself or is there a repository of 3D object designs available? Stand still, Tony. <laughs> there we go. We've got a screenshot. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, no, I, I went to the 3 Doodler website. Right. You know, like uh, a lot of 3D printers uh, recommend you go to Thingiverse, Thingiverse or yeah. GitHub or something like that. And... Uh, and you uh, download a pattern and send it to your 3D printer. Yes. Well, with this, you go to the 3 Doodler website and you download a piece of paper. Right. And you print that out. So that's, that's a clever. series of, of 2D shapes to print rather than... Because exactly. obviously you can't get a blender file and then draw the whole 3D. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, you you know, in, in one way you could just like draw flat and fill in yeah. and, and, and then, you know, build it up. There's one that they showed in the Kickstarter video, which was the Eiffel Tower, mm. which was they did four sides the same oh, cool. and then bring them together to make the full the full tower and lots of other bits to construct. Good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, it would probably be quite time-consuming, I would imagine, but quite worthwhile to have this, you know, plastic Eiffel Tower. So your glasses are very natty green colour. They are, um, yes. But I see you have packets of... Well, look like pencils. Yeah, or so when, when you... Yeah, they look like, yeah, the kind of packs of plasticine you get yeah. with lots of different colours. Um I ordered when I when I backed it. One of the options was to have a pack of different colours, and um, yeah, so you got each, six. Each pack has got um, five colours in it. So there's like a red, yellow, green, blue, and there's a pink. There's a, there's a kind of light colours, and there's some kind of earthy, less desirable colours as well. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're for practicing with <laughs> thrown, thrown in the box as well. Well, the brown one, if you want to do a retro Ubuntu logo, I guess. Um, and the other question that Mark asked was. Um, about uh, drawing directly upwards, you you kind of can, and in the video they do show the guy holding the pen on the page and then just pulling upwards slowly, and it can set just about yeah. it can go cold just about enough that you can draw straight up, but it's it's not very stable and um, yeah, it's not very reliable. Mm. You you kind of, and this is where it kind of falls apart a little bit is the the way in which you can uh, draw. You have to really plan out your your construction so if you right. want to if you want to draw something like a a tube yes that's really quite hard yeah because if you think of a tube laying down on its side you lay down one line for the very bottom and then you start laying additional lines to try and build it up and then you're you kind of get stuck because yeah, the bits there's nothing fall to support either the side. Yeah, yeah there's no structure to support it yeah um so you have to be kind of inventive about how you how you uh draw yes. certain but shapes that, i mean that's the same with any 3d printer you have to be careful yeah. about where you're going to have holes and where you need scaffolding and so on. And it's quite cool because that's something that engineers do hmm. all the time. But typically we don't. We t normally work in 2D, even if you're making cubes and things in maths classes. It's always about the you know folding it up. But to actually design that template in the first place is quite a lot of sort of mental rotation and things. So it's pretty cool practicing yeah, that. And and on the website where you can you can print out these these plans for stuff you can you can draw. Um it's a bit disappointing actually that then there's not enough uh really inventive stuff there that people have done yet. Now granted I was one of the first backers, so I'm one of the first, I don't know, a few thousand people who have one. So not a lot of people have come up with designs and and submitted them to the website so it's early days um but a lot of the the designs they've seemed to have seeded with basically just clip art mm. you know like pictures of you know there's a there's a christmas decorations one which is basically lots of 2d clip art that you you're basically expected to trace over right. but i think they're just there to give you ideas and to seed the site with something mm. i want one now <laughs> <laughs> i could really get into doing 3d christmas decorations yeah it's funny i i i went to i took it over to uh the in-laws at the weekend to show them and um 
they said, oh, what, what can you do with it? And I said, well, you know, what do you want me to do with it? <laughs> and, and the kids, the kids said, oh, can you make a, can you make me a, a ring? Um, with some decoration on it. So I, I went, yeah. I did a, a, like a cylinder, went round and round and round and round once. And then I changed the color of yeah. the, of the, um, the plastic that was in it. And when you change the color of the plastic, because there's some plastic still inside, when you put a new stick in, there's a period of time where it transitions from whatever color was in there to the new color. So you actually, you don't quite know when the new colors go arrive. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a transition period where you go from the old color to the new color. And that's most noticeable if you go like from white to red or something. Yeah. You're, you're doing white and then suddenly it's a bit pink and then it's all red. Um, but, it, you know, for making kids like um, play jewelry or something like that, then, you know, it, it's quite good fun. And you can like decorate it, but you have to be quite careful. You probably would want... Um, some of those um, claws that you would use for soldering mm. or circuit work or, you know, something that could hold it because I was holding it in my, in my fingers because the tip gets really hot. Yeah. It was, I could feel the heat from the thing, you know, right. on my fingers when I was trying to decorate this little ring for the kids. I want one for Christmas. Are they selling them yet? Uh, I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's Tony being ill or <laughs> Ill, in, Ill is induced by the fact he has to buy a present. Um, I don't think you can get them yet. I think you can pre-order them mm. uh, because that, that was the October um, Kickstarter group. Um, and I got that a week ago mm. in November. The November group have, ju- have just started shipping and then there's the December. And then, so I think if you pre-ordered it, you wouldn't get it till like early next year. No, it's over the Christmas holidays. I'm thinking that'd be cool. Yeah, no chance. Decorate the house um, in plastic. One of the, one of the, one of the other things about it is it does make a bit of noise. Mm. Um, it has a it has a motor in it that pulls the plastic through and feeds it into the the um, mm, the yeah. hot end, and it also has a fan to cool down. They've obviously realised that this thing gets hot and they need to cool the thing down again. So there's a fan in there. So I, if I just start drawing now, it's heated up. And if I start okay. drawing, you'll probably hear it on the mic. Oh right. Um, it's got two buttons for two different speeds. Ah. And um, high and low. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> I wonder if I've uh... welcome to tomorrow's world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So yeah, it it is a little bit noisy and uh, just buzzes, doesn't it? Yeah, it's basically just the the motor. A bit like a dentist. Oh man! Door. If you could imagine what Have something quite it? noisy sounds like. No, I think you broke it. <laughs> so yeah. the, the the two the two buttons give you different speeds. Is it? Um, I mean, do you need the slow version to get used to using it, and then the fast one is when you're better, or are they for sort of different types of drawing? Um, I haven't had enough practice. I, I, I guess I, I started with the slow because I thought, well, if I press the fast, it's all going to come flying out. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be spraying plastic all over the room, uh, which is actually not the case. Right. Uh, you know, when you, you press the button, it comes out fairly slowly, which, uh, whichever one you use. And, and actually, the fast one is preferable. When I did the glasses, yeah. I actually used the fast mode because I was d- traversing long, yeah. long lines. And actually, it's quite hard to hold something rigid and, and go and backwards and forwards and, slowly, and yeah. steady and slowly. So you have to kind of keep stopping and starting every so often. Otherwise, right. your arm aches a lot. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the fast mode lets you do more of a sort of natural speed of drawing a straight line. There we, oh, there we go. Oh. It's started working. Yeah. So it's hard to actually talk into the microphone while I'm doing this uh, but yeah I'm, I'm sure you can probably hear the noise this is making well hopefully listeners you're listening to the sound of a motor yes, yes. and is that the fan going as well yes right that's mostly the fan yeah it does sound kind of like an electric toothbrush so you're drawing there you're drawing on a piece of paper is it now just going to be stuck to the piece of paper forever not forever uh, <laughs> a while until I let it cool down a little bit but it cools down really really quickly I mean that's I've just drawn a little square right but I can I can pick it off straight away. What I tend to do though is peel the paper uh, or roll the paper so that oh. it just oh, pops, I see. It just off. pops off. Okay, yeah, I like that. And that's, yeah, it's not it. snapping as you put it, so it's fairly sort of um, it's bendy, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. I mean, that's only one line of the stuff. You would yeah. generally go over it more than once to build it up. In the same way that you wouldn't draw one line with a with a conventional three D printer, you'd yeah, yeah, you'd build up the structure a little bit. Wow, I think that's a podcasting first. Alan drawing a square with plastic <laughs> live on the internet. Next, yeah. next time you're going to go for a star or something slightly more complicated. Well, you just don't know, do you? The the LED on it's gone green now. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it's got three states. It's like red when it's um, heating up, green uh, when it's ready to go, and 
blue if you're using the different type of plastic ABS because it's got two temperatures for the two types of plastic. And there's on the back, there's two holes. Yeah, for Tell mounting, us about the holes. The the holes were a surprise that the backers were told about fairly fairly towards the end of the of the the thing. Um, that's so you can mount it somehow on something. And so people does, have, does this thing exist yet? Well, some people have constructed things out of Lego Mindstorms. Ooh. Um, so, you know, you could you could make a 3D printer. With that um, as the nozzle. Yeah. Brilliant. And, and you know, you don't, you don't actually have to buy this plastic. I mean, they, they recommend, you know, buy our plastic. Yes. Because, you know, it's designed for the, the thing and it's tested. But, you know, potentially you could buy a cheap roll of plastic, which yeah. is way cheaper than buying these little sticks of plastic. Mm-hmm. And much more convenient because you could get a continuous feed in. Yes. Um, or, a, you know, a longer feed than than just having these little sticks but the thing is the little sticks are quite convenient because yeah. you can just sit there and draw for a little bit and then change the color of something else mm. and you're not stuck with one color forever well tommy bobbins who's listening live and is in the rc channel suggested that hey, on hearing the noise that your laptop might be overheating again <laughs> <laughs> yeah you probably a similar something. temperature it's it's similar it's just a bit noisier than a computer fan yes excellent well thank you very much for telling yes. us about your exciting new toy alan we've got some command line love um this one's explainshell.com and it's not actually a command line thing but you can put commands from a command line into this web page and press a button saying explain and it tells you something so th- <laughs> this is this has basically got all of the man pages ah. from all of the command line tools in the ubuntu repository i believe parsed and in a database so you paste in a command with a load of options and arguments and it basically picks apart each one, finds it in the man page for that command uh. and then gives you a little thing saying, well, you've called this command which does this and you've given it this option with this argument. So It'll that means it's going to do... Yeah, exactly. So you've said, you know, you said grep and you've said R, which means it's going to be recursive and this is the pattern you've used and these are the files you're searching. And you can like chain commands together and it'll... Yeah, it pulls the bits out of the man page, so you don't have to go. You don't have to like go hunting through a man page to work out what a command's going to do. And this is going to be particularly handy if you're, say, you know, you've asked a question on Ask Ubuntu or a forum or something, and someone said, "Oh, just use this command," and you want to check what the command's actually going to do. It will. It's a really good way of looking it up quickly. It's good, but it's kind of it's a bit limited. I just t- um, put in ls latr and it. It said ls and what ls does, and then it went through each of the parameters yeah. one after the other, which was quite cool. And it told me what each of those parameters does. Yeah. But I tried sudo app get dist upgrade. Yeah, yeah. I just did that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it tells me that sudo executes a command as another user, and then the bit app get dist upgrade tells me, I think, a parameter for sudo. It doesn't figure out that oh, that is right. the command that so, I would. So want if you to just run. do app get dist upgrade, does it give you something a bit more useful? Um. It's yes, quite, right. It gives you exactly so, what you'd expect. Well, it tells it you what apt does and then what dist upgrade does. So you can file a bug on GitHub. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. There's a link uh, on there to to the GitHub page for it. And there's 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 various other one of the other issues which has been reported is that um if you have a a big command with lots of arguments, um it it then displays the explanation out of order because what what it does is each explanation is joined to the the bit in the command by a line. So when you hover over it, you can see which bit you're looking at. But the only way to do that with a long line is to start off by doing the stuff in the middle first so it can have a line going straight down. And then you have the bit at the beginning somewhere in the middle and the bit at the end somewhere near the bottom so the lines can go around the outside, which does make it a bit hard to scan down. Right. But um, It's pretty cool, though. Yeah, Mm. it is. It's really cool. I like it. Hmm. It's time for your feedback. And to start with, Martin emailed in with some help improving command line history handling. So this was following on from a thing last time where we had, uh, was it the command line love? Where you could search your history, for yes. your command yes. history. 
Um, so he's suggesting several ways to improve command line history handling. Oh, because we were complaining that uh, if you have lots of shells open... Oh, yeah, they don't put the history in the they same don't place. They save your history in the same yeah. place, yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of different things. One, where, the, where you can set the history list to append to a file that's named... Um, rather than when the shell exits, rather than overwriting the file, because I think we were saying that every terminal right. overwrote the file so that only the last terminals were saved. Right. Yeah. Um, one about saying the maximum number of lines in the history, one's how many history entries will actually be stored in memory, and one, if you want all your shells to co- share a common command history, you can set something else, and you can stick all of this in the uh, bash IC um, pro- uh, user profile. Awesome. Brilliant. That's really good. Mm. I'm going to do that because, yes, I'm still suffering with that. Cool. Jesse Paulson from Canada emailed us to tell us a dirty little, little Linux secret he found. It seems that Linux file systems do not currently support creation date slash birth date metadata. When, Outrageous. When you create a file in Ubuntu, the value of C time works as a creation time. But if you modify its size or permissions, C time is reset and there is no record of the file's actual birthday. Oh. So you can't buy it a present. Oh. It seems so strange to me that something so fundamental to DOS, Windows, and Mac file systems just doesn't exist in Ubuntu. It is sometimes something that all of us should be aware of, especially when transferring files between operating systems. In my research, I discovered that the stat command supports a B time, but for reasons I'm not quite geeky enough to grok... <laughs> even though he is geeky enough to use the word grok. <laughs> yes. There are so, some memory space and kernel thingies that are meant uh, that mean that the B time field is never populated. If there is there a means of implementing the birthday function in Ubuntu? There are workarounds for JPEG where the creation date is stored in the EXIF data, but standard text files lose this information with regular file operations. I did not know that. It's a worry. Commit I've, all your files to version control. I've well. come across that actually. And there was something at work where um, we had, on one platform we found that the um, I think it had been written for Unix, so it did. Uh, sorry, written for Windows, so yeah. it did do that. And then on the other platform, we were like, "Why is it not working?" Mm. I, it's interesting, you, you know. Tony dismisses this as not uh, not <laughs> not particularly useful information, perhaps. But <laughs> I think you take me a scan, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'll blame it on your illness, uh, but. Actually, this week, I had to try and find out the original date of a file um, to help corroborate someone's story of when they did a piece of work. Ah. Um, Because they did a piece of work and someone, you know, suspected that the work was done later. And we wanted to go back in time and check the file system to see that actually, no, that work was done when they said it was done at at a certain point in time. And uh, so, yeah, it can that can be pretty useful. Were you able to do it? Yeah, but I was on a Mac at the time. <laughs> so, you know, I, don't, I, I, I didn't come across this particular problem. Right. Um, but uh, what I'm saying is that there are situations where I would yes. want to see the creation time of a file. I can see how that is a problem. Mm. Um, Robert from SoCal USA emailed... I noticed on the last podcast you didn't mention Ubuntu's new streamlined desktop icons. I spotted this report on Engadget.com's website last week talking about it. I thought Ubuntu's desktop icons looked good. Oh. Uh, This is the mobile icons. Uh, Yeah, I I clicked through to the article and those icons don't look like our icons. Those are the mobile icons, aren't they? Yes. 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 Desktop and mobile icons redesigned and united at last, the article says. So, so yeah, this is for the next release, is it? Yeah, hopefully in, hopefully in time for 14.04. Right. Cool. So they're going to... Yeah, the, 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 the icons on the... I'm not sure how to describe them. There's a certain something about the icons on the mobile. They look like Android KitKat. Do they? Yeah. My, my icons on KitKat don't seem oh. to have changed very much. Oh, mine have. They're all white. They're all white. And... Mm. They're, they're all within the Ubuntu shape. Oh, within the Ubuntu, what's the Ubuntu shape? The Ubuntu shape is a very well defined squircle. A squircle. <laughs> yeah, it's a square with with rounded <laughs> rounded corners. corners. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. But it's a very specific shape, and the oh okay. You know, the, so it's not just the it's radius not just of the corners. An icon defined. on a sort of flore- on a sort of translucent square, like it is at the moment. No, right. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so this is for the, all of the default apps. Uh, yep, all of the default apps and uh, some of the um, user submitted apps are using the same format and same styling um a lot of them are you know discussing with the design team how to do the best style icons and we have people working on 
uh, icons for the next release. And finally, the debate about Tony's jingles goes on. Oh, yeah, oh good. Jingles. <laughs> Leave my jingles out of it. Ian Roberts says, please stop the we need you, yes you jingle and add more quizzes. <laughs> More quizzes is capitalised. More quizzes. More quizzes, yes. Anton, Anton Piatek said, yes, I can't remember the last time you UPC did a quiz. Mm. Mm, fair enough. And Alastair Grant replied that we should keep both. We should yeah. have quizzes and jingles. Jingles and quizzes. No right. time for anything else then. So let's just carry on as we were. Yeah. Um, yeah Maybe I lo- we should do a Christmas quiz. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I like the sound of that. That would keep everyone happy, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Everybody would be a winner. Right, um, enjoy this one then, Alistair. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that pleases, puzzles or piques you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. I think a quiz next time would be great. (laughs) (laughs) That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. The next live show will be on the Wednesday, the 18th of December, and will be the last one of the year. Yeah, the last live show of the year yes. already. Boo. Ooh. And then we have a break, don't we? We'll go on holiday together. <laughs> Something like that. Yes. And we send back photos of us sitting on the beach with our Android phones. And... Is this going to well, be like, like the bit at the end of the series of, uh, of end of a series of Hustle where we break the fourth wall and say goodbye to all the viewers? Or 2.4 children for those of us who understand things like that. <laughs> okay. Did they do on 2.4 children as they well? They always had like a musical with Christmas jumpers and then say bye. Oh, okay. Oh, Merry Christmas. Let's do that now then. Bye. Bye. Merry Christmas. <laughs>